Good evening, everyone. Okay, we begin the readout tonight with a history lesson starring Major General Smedley Butler. Now, you may be a little-known name outside of military circles, but don't let that fool you. This is a Marine with a big military resume, starting with the war against Spain in 1898. He was twice awarded the Medal of Honor. Hollywood loved him. So did Theodore Roosevelt, who called him the ideal American soldier. But the story we're going to tell didn't happen in a conflict overseas, but rather in Pennsylvania, where one day a bond salesman approached Butler with a pitch. Imagine half a million veterans marching on Washington, a move financed by some of the most powerful corporations in America. The purpose? To stop President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, which was opposed by wealthy business leaders as a socialist doctrine. This army of veterans would pressure the president to hand over executive powers of government. And if the president refused, he would be forced to resign. The bond salesman, after, you know, casually pitching the violent overthrow of the U.S. government, then asked Butler if he would be interested in heading this march, to which General Butler replied, my one hobby is maintaining a democracy. If you get these 500,000 soldiers advocating anything smelling of fascism, I am going to get 500,000 more and lick the hell out of you. And we will have a real war right at home. The general then reported this exchange to the U.S. government. And here he is revealing the so-called business plot before a panel of the Special House Committee on Un-American Activities. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The panel, the media, the American public did not take this exchange as seriously as Butler did. No one was ever prosecuted or even punished. The allegations turned into one big joke, an elaborate scheme by the super rich to topple the U.S. government for their own financial interests. Impossible, right? Right? What Major General Butler did for American democracy was certainly heroic, whether people at the time believed him or not. He was also far from the perfect hero. He would even call himself a racketeer for capitalism. Jonathan Katz, who wrote about Butler in his new book, outlines how Butler blazed a path for the U.S. empire, helping seize the Philippines and land for the Panama Canal, invading and helping plunder Honduras and Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and more. Meaning he played a heavy hand in all that yucky stuff or in movies. America as empire tends to sell fewer tickets. But perhaps it was those layers and contradictions that allowed Butler to see what this pitch was really about. An alleged political conspiracy to overthrow President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and install a fascist government in his place. Fast forward almost nine decades, and we've now witnessed another attempted coup led by a man who simply couldn't admit that he lost an election and whose movement of Trumpism was created and funded and sustained by big business. That populist bit, that was just a sham. And just like in 1934, we're seeing a similar pattern of denialism and deflection when it comes to what we're up against. Dozens of witnesses and participants in the January 6th insurrection have stonewalled the select committee. And several who have testified still refuse to answer questions. Most recently, the right-wing fake news host, Alex Jones, revealed that he pleaded his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination nearly 100 times during an interview on Monday. John Eastman, the notorious Trump lawyer who literally put the plan for a coup in writing, also claimed his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination as a response to nearly 150 questions and to document and to his document subpoena. According to a lawyer, for the House, who spoke to CNN. But in contrast with the alleged fascist plot of 1934, we're seeing a modicum of accountability when it comes to the MAGA mob who served as Trump's boots on the ground on January 6th. Just today, Stuart Rhodes and nine of his Oath Keeper cohorts pleaded not guilty to charges of seditious conspiracy. They're among more than 700 who've been charged in connection with this current insurrection. Joining me now is Malcolm Nance, MSNBC counterterrorism and intelligence analyst and the author of the upcoming book, They Want to Kill Americans, The Militias, 
terrorists and, derang and the deranged ideology of the Trump insurgency. And Jonathan Katz, aforementioned author of The Racket newsletter and of the new book, Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, The Making and Breaking of America's Empire. I want to start with you, Jonathan Katz. I so enjoyed this incredible long read about Smedley Butler. What a name, first of all. Right. Talk a little bit about this plot that we've sort of outlined going in here. As you've researched this, how real was this attempt? How serious were they? And who were some of the sort of big business and corporate interests behind it? So what we know is basically what Butler testified in front of Congress in November 1934. And that is that a representative of a prominent Wall Street financial institution came to him and tried to enlist him in this plot. We can be pretty sure that the guy who approached him thought that there was a fascist coup behind him that he was trying to foment. Uh, in my research, I can tell you that his boss, a guy named Grayson M.P. Murphy, had a long intelligence background. He had been uh, involved in overthrowing governments overseas. Uh, he was certainly the kind of person who might have been uh, involved in this. Beyond that, all we have is the idea that the representative of this uh, brokerage, a guy, a guy named uh, Gerald C. McGuire, told Butler that there were going to be big names coming to support it from behind the scenes, and that those names would include people like the DuPonts, uh, Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors, the McCann Eric uh, 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 ad agency, Phillips Oil, Sun Oil, places like that. What we don't know is how involved they were and what to what extent the planning had, had gone forward before uh, uh, Butler was approached and then came forward to blow the And we know that something called the Liberty League was ultimately formed, and it was these same, you know, industrialists and wealthy people who didn't like the idea of having a new deal because and they, they, they tagged it as socialism, right? They said it's socialism and we need to, we'd rather have fascism than that. Yeah, in 1934, much as in 2022, a lot of people thought that liberal democracy was on the way out and that the only ways forward were either fascism or communism. And to the business elite in America, fascism seemed like the more attractive of those two options. So we don't know, again, whether any of the, the, the big names uh, that, that uh, Jerry Maguire you know, said we're going to be coming behind this, we're actually behind it to what degree they were. But we do know that a number of people who were members of the Liberty League, uh, including, you know, the head of uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, was a big fan of Mussolini. He, he said that he was a, he considered himself some of a, uh, a missionary for the Italian fascists. We know that Hugh Johnson, who was part of the New Deal administration, uh, who was also mooted as somebody who was going to be involved in the business plot, he also uh, was a committed admirer of, of Mussolini and European fascism. And we know that the, the guy who approached uh, Smedley Butler, Jerry Maguire, he had been on a tour of the fascist hotspots of Europe and met with members of one of the real antecedents to January 6th. Uh, in February of 1934, there was a fascist and far-right riot in Paris to storm the parliament uh, to uh, prevent the, the uh, handover of power to a center-left prime minister, mm -hmm. uh, which there are a lot of ties between that and, and January 6th. And we know that Maguire met with, with members of the Quad de Feu, which were, you know, maybe sort of the oath keepers of, of Paris <laughs> 1934. Yeah. So, you know, there... there there was, there was, there's a lot to say that there would have been support for a coup like this if it had uh, pushed forward, at least in terms of the people that, that McGuire was saying were behind it. Yeah. We just don't know the extent to which this planning had gone forward, in large part because Congress cut the investigation short. Yeah.